right, welcome back everybody. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy Friday to join us for our Dada lecture series. Uh, I wanna thank as always our speakers committee without their support, we would not be able to bring in such amazing designers, art historians, artists to speak with us on Friday afternoons. Uh, this week, we have one of our uh, speakers in our design lecture series. Uh, as you guys know from throughout the semester, we asked some of our Webster alumni to uh, nominate and ask uh, various people within their field and their network to uh, uh, ask speakers to come in and talk to the Webster Dada community. Uh, this week's nominating alumni, we have Ashley Webelhuth, who is a BFA alum from 2016. Ashley currently serves as the art director at Nestle Purina, and Ashley will be introducing today's speaker. If you want to take it over, Ashley. Sure, thank you so much. I am super excited to introduce Teresa Sauceville to all of you. She is someone who I first met last summer during a virtual interview at uh, Purina during the middle you know, of this whole pandemic. And um, I heard nothing but great like rave reviews about her prior to that interview. And then once I was hired on attending like the all agency meetings, I really saw how much of a rock that she is for the company. I mean, she is there for support. She's so knowledgeable. And um, she's really, really positive and encouraging. And a lot of teammates go to her for um, you know anything, any insights that they need. She is such a, a great, knowledgeable person. So that, along with some of the themes that we had been talking to Noriko with, um, I felt like she would be the perfect fit for this. So I don't want to steal her thunder or give away what she's talking about just yet but I will tell you a little bit more about her really quickly and then pitch it over to her. So Teresa has more than 20 years of experience in the marketing and creative fields. She believes in the power of creativity to make authentic connections between people and the brands they choose and champions that belief in her current role as executive creative director at Nestle Purina. Over the course of her career, she is grateful to have been a part of global companies as well as small startups. In 2003, she left a large company to be a founding member of an independent creative marketing agency and she, that she helped grow more than 700% in only five years. In addition to these pursuits, Teresa acted as an adjunct professor and student advisor at St. Louis University and is currently an active member of the National Charity League. She is a graduate of Missouri State University where she was named the College of Business Administration's Graduate of the Year. So with that, Teresa, I will pitch it over to you. Well, hello everyone. <laughs> And thank you so much for um, the kind introductions. I had no idea you were going to say all that. That was very kind of you. Thank you. And so let me say how excited I am to be here. I love, 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 love talking to college students. Um, ever since I was a college student, I had a dream of being a college professor. And um, I was able to do that in a small way, like um, Ashley mentioned at, at SLU as an adjunct. And so when I got this invite, I was wholeheartedly saying yes, because I just love the energy of being with you all. And since we are virtual, I'm, I have a favor. I have a favor to ask of you. Um, I'm 100% here with you, and I would love to hear from you. So give me some of your energy. Um, I will have some prompts in the chat, but also just use the chat. And um, let's have a conversation and you could um, kind of give me some feedback along the way and I'll even adjust the presentation as we go to fit what most meets uh, your needs and why you're here today. So let's go ahead and dive right in. One of the first questions I get when I say I work at, work at Purina is, do you have a dog and can you take your dog to work? And the answer is yes and yes. So here is Ziggy, meet Ziggy. There he is on moving day. And just for fun, I also brought this video of some other furry coworkers on campus at Purina. So always, always good fun. 
So um, my goal for today is to share stories from my creative journey and not just the shiny high points, um, the failures, the challenges, and the misdirections. That's why, that way it's not just me that learned the lessons, you can learn from my mistakes too. And yes, Noriko, you did see Amela in the video. Um, she's a star, isn't she? Um, and she has two uh, pets now. So I am going to start this off with where you are sitting now in college. So my journey began um, at Missouri State, about four hours away from here. And I was in the business school. And I'll tell you why I was in the business school. Um, I got a piece of advice from someone to say, like, if you don't know what major to pick, just go back to the course catalog. And at the time, I need to set the stage for you. The course catalog was like a phone book. It was all printed out on this really thin paper. And you would just flip through it and everything would have like serial numbers at the top. And, you'd, and that's how you would select your classes. So I'm flipping through it. And the advice was, see what things you're interested in. And if you can find enough classes in a department that you're interested in, that should probably be where you go. So at the time, as I'm trying to decide my major, I was really interested in 2D and 3D design. I was interested in architecture, writing and literature, so kind of more creative things. But I thought to myself, I need to be an adult. I've got to really get to that working kind of side. So I'm going to be a business major because that business majors, you know, they get jobs. So that's what I picked. But now, you know, the joke is on my 19 year old self because I ended up in a creative field anyway. So here's your first chance um, to uh, join in the chat if you haven't already. Thank you guys so much, like Emily, Gregory, Senna, Raven, Noriko for um, already participating. I appreciate it. But just tell me in the chat, um, I'd love to hear about what kind of range of majors you might have. And even if you've changed majors, um, from what to what, what did you change to? And I'd love to hear about it. This will add up to something I will be talking about shortly. So I'll give you guys a second. Oh, nice. Thank you, Emily. That's a big switch. <laughs> nice. Nice, Michael. See, you listen to your professor. I love it. Oh, nice, Sophia. An interactive digital media. A double major? Oh, nice. Graphic design. Well, thank you for all this context. I appreciate it. Just to kind of know who's in the crowd. Um, this will, like I said, it'll add up a little bit to something I'll talk about different job opportunities because I want to make sure I give you things that can be useful. Thank you very much. I love that comment from Monica. I've always loved art, so I knew it's what I wanted to do. Way to go. That's awesome to know right away. So um, speaking of journey, I will dive into my journey. It's an overview of mine career-wise. And you see there Missouri State. Um, I did join the AAF ad team. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go. And I'm thinking this will click for me, but hold on. I'm hoping it will click. OK, that worked. So um, my first stop was at Noble and Associates where I was told I was a creative and I believed them finally. And then I ventured to Zipatoni, which was a smaller agency that got by a, bought by a big agency here in St. Louis. So probably most of you don't know of Zipatoni. It's not in existence anymore. And there I was the lowest person on the totem pole and I did anything I was told. Next, I left that very big, big company and I went way outside to a very small company, a startup, Musylvania. And after about eight years there, I came home to Purina. Purina was a place that I had always wanted to work. And I had that opportunity to come in-house and work at Checkmark, and that's where I am today. So that's a quick overview in pictures. Also, you heard about it in my bio. Um, and in talking with Ashley prepping for today, she said it would be helpful to share my story, but also talk about checkmark, talk about jobs and let you guys in to just a little bit about what it's like to be at an in-house agency. 
So I'm going to pause the story about Teresa for a second and move to the story of Checkmark. The next thing I'm going to show you is a video that's a sizzle reel of the types of work that we do, as well as um, actual samples of work. So I'll go ahead and start that now. Um, thanks all for um, watching that along with me there. Um, I'll say a little bit more about Checkmark as an overview. So we are the in-house creative resource of Nestle Purina. And when you are in-house, that means that you are an employee of the big company. So you have the same business goals, you have the same bonus targets, everything. You're 100% tied to the performance and the success of that company. Checkmark is about 170 people. We do all the major type of work, as you see there, for all the brands, but we don't do everything for every brand. We work with external agencies, vendor partners, and other teams to make all of this come to life. Um, we carry the heart and the soul of Purina in everything that we do. We're 100% invested in this company. Um, what's just some fun facts for uh, the Webster folk, for all you Webster folks, um, this was put together by a Webster alum, several of the packages and um, all of that was done in the direction of a Webster alum. Um, and then several designers across the teams are from Webster. So look at that, it's all full circle. Um, now, I'll, absolutely, I agree. Um, so next, I have another chat for you. And I know I hit you with a couple chats back to back. You'll take, we'll have a break after this, I promise. But um, do you know what kind of job you want or what jobs you're interested in so far? Because the next slide I'm going to talk about, oh, web development. Thank you, Sophia. Um, 
I'm going to talk about how we're organized very loosely, very, very loosely, just to give you some ideas of some job titles that are out there. What's inside of Checkmark is very indicative of what's out there industry wide. And um, I can definitely see how some titles are changing and I'll, I'll indicate that. I think it's helpful to know what jobs you can maybe apply for. So that's what I'm here for, trying to help. And so now I'll go ahead. Again, this is a not to scale, not to perfection, but just a general illustration of some groups that are inside Checkmark. So the first group we'll talk about is the creative department. So if you're trying to look for a job in a creative department, you'll likely work um, under a creative director that is under a creative lead. Um, the types of jobs that you might look for would be like art director, designer, writer, production artist. Um, those, and then you know, senior writer, senior art director. It kind of progresses up the scale that way. And there, at the end of the line, there, just I have the addition because it's an important distinction to note. There are some positions out there that won't be full time right away. Maybe you might start out as an intern, or maybe you'll start out as a contractor. And contractors are at all levels. Like we can have senior contractors, associate creative director, creative director contractors, um, and then they would come in and cut for a six month or a year or even 18 month type contract. So those are all opportunities when you're looking for a job. And I see on here we've got like package design, publication, that type of thing. All of those would be on that in that area that I just talked about. What I just clicked on was content team. And I noticed that um, there were even people who were looking at maybe some videos, uh, video content in their major. So content team might be focused on like video, motion graphics, content designer, content writers. Sometimes people put things like social media director, things like that in their title in this category. Now, I did see this come through on quite a few, quite a few of you about app design, UX, UI design. Now, some of that can be underneath a creative department. And here at Checkmark, we have a bridge between the digital products and the creative department. I just have them as two separate circles for simplicity right now. But under UX, UI, typically you're gonna have some sort of pod where you'll have a designer, a developer that's deep in the technical skills and a strategist. So it sounds like a lot of you might be interested over in that type of pod universe. Also in under digital products, maybe you don't make the actual product. Like maybe you don't figure out how Spotify works, but you might have to do a marketing campaign for it and understand the product pretty intensely um, and not intensely, <laughs> intimately. And in that case, you'll be working really closely with the UX UI designers and need to have some of those types of skills. Over here, um, you. I, I don't really see a lot of you going into this direction, at least from your majors, but who knows, right? Um, you could get into the creative universe by thinking through strategy. And we've actually had several creative people work in the industry a long time and then end up here um, as far as strategy or even in the actual execution as far as content planning strategy and uh, data analytics. And then on the account side, that is what we know account to be um, that traditional relationship back between the creatives and all of the clients and the different partners. So that's a quick overview of some of the jobs that are out there, some of the job titles that are out there. And um, I'll say if anybody has any questions on this, we can always come back to it um, and just kind of jot them down. Or if you want to throw them in the chat, I can answer them now. All right, just say, hold on to them if you want to talk to about them, talk about them later. So we will go back from um, just talking about checkmark in the industry as a whole and go back to my journey and the lessons that I learned. And hopefully, again, you'll find something that will be helpful for you here. So the first lesson that I talked about was, um, you know, you can write this journey as you go. So I started at Missouri State. I was in the College of Business. I thought that that's what I needed to do to get a job. But ultimately, um, there was this idea of a, the next decision that I was going to make was either going to solidify that um, decision in that major, or it was going to kind of slightly change direction. Ultimately, by joining AAF Ad Team, and really turning myself in that direction, it started this trajectory. 
that through Noble Zip and on the way through to where I am today. So here we look at this chart and it looks like nice and pretty, doesn't it? It's like this perfectly straight line and it's really easy. But in reality, this is what it felt like. And um, I'm gonna take you through the ups and downs of this journey and I'm gonna share with you some of what really happened. And maybe um, it might make you laugh or at least cringe a little bit, but um, that's all right. We'll, <laughs> we'll go along it together. So my first lesson that I'd like to tell you about, I learned at Noble and Associates. And that lesson is seek feedback. So um, full transparency, I wasn't that great at seeking feedback at that point in my life. And actually at that point in my life, I had to hear this particular piece of feedback three times before it sunk in. And once I finally listened, it really changed the course of my life. So um, the first time I heard this piece of feedback, I was in college, I joined AAF ad team and they needed to hand out jobs. And my professor said, all right, well, you're gonna be a team creative. And I had doubts about if I was actually able to be a creative person. And she told me, well, the job is to come up with ideas and do writing. And I thought to myself, well, psh, well, if it's that, I can do that, that's easy. But I didn't really think of it as a job. So that was the first time I heard it and I kind of glossed over it. So the second time, I had an assignment in a management class for extra credit. And the assignment was to take the exercise that we just did, which was operating a factory in different ways and write a paper about what we learned. And so I decided to write it as a big analogy that running this factory was like learning to snow ski. And it was way out there, but I had fun writing it. And, um, and then I turned it in. So the next time we went into class, the professor handed out all the papers and held on to one and said, Teresa, see me after class. And so I was definitely really nervous when I went and saw him and he goes, I had to tell you, this is the most creative piece of writing I've ever seen. You should not be running a factory. And I thought to myself, okay, haha, -ha, funny. Did I get the extra credit? And I moved on. And then it's the third time. I was working at Noble and Associates and I was hired on there as an account person. I was just excited to get a job and be in an agency. And there was a um, creative director that took me under her wing and she had me work on a bunch of copywriting assignments. And she was just increasingly giving me more assignments to where eventually I stopped being an, an account person and started working full-time as a copywriter. And the owner of the agency came in and said, all right, Teresa, we've got a job for you. And it turns out that the opening that they had was in the account service department. They said, why don't you go back? And my mentor pleaded with me and said, don't, don't do it. I know you want a job. I, and it was, by the way, it was a recession. So it was like any job you had to hold on to. And she said, don't do it. Don't do it. You are a creative. And I listened to her. I did not take the job. And so this first lesson was when you get feedback from people who know you and who actually have your best interest at heart, and that's critical, don't just take feedback from anybody because there's way too many haters out there. But when you get feedback from people who know you and who care about you, listen, because you won't always believe it or hear it. It won't always be your reality, but people can see what you can't. And I'm so glad that I listened to them and had that feedback um, because it next, it really changed my whole world. Now we'll go to the next stop. So here I am unemployed after Notable and Associates, but fortunately I was able to find a job at Zipatoni. Um, Zipatoni, like I said before, I was the lowest, lowest, lowest person on the totem pole here. And people came up to me, no joke, people came up to me and they said, we've never hired anyone as green as you. If you do well, we might hire other new, other newbies as well. <laughs> I was like, okay, no pressure. But I, I really did. I felt enormous pressure to take everything that crossed my desk and give it my all. And that's where I learned the next big lesson, which was embrace effort. So here's the question. When you're faced with effort, you can make a decision. How are you going to face it? Are you going to like make it painful and feel the slog every step of the way? Or are you gonna wrap your arms around it and love it? And I think you can see what I'm advocating for and just the positive embracing of it is really the only way to go. 
because learning sucks sometimes. You are going to fail, you're going to look stupid, and that's not fun. And it really helps if you love what you're doing because it gives you that energy to keep going. So there I was at Zip. I poured my heart into it. I embraced that effort. And one day I was rewarded. My bosses gave me a big project, a big assignment. I was more on my own. And then I made a big mistake. The mistake was a typo on a printed brochure that was thousands and thousands, might as well have been millions of dollar to, dollars to reprint it. So you can imagine me sitting at my little cubicle and being called and saying, Mitch wants to see you. <laughs> so I was called into her office and I was terrified. And she asked, how did this happen? And I just said, I don't know. I was trying really hard. I thought I had it and I missed it. And she looked at me for what felt like an hour, but really it's probably only like 10 seconds. And she said, I know you put in 100% effort. I know you learn from everything that you're working on. And I know you won't make that mistake again. And I credit this attitude of embracing effort with saving my job. And I also credit it with getting the eye of this business leader who then eventually advocated for my promotion. Now, let's travel to Musylvania, nicknamed Moose. And you'll see the journey um, on Musylvania. It's pretty dramatic, isn't it? That's an actual real life representation of what it felt like. Um, Moose was a startup. So um, I left the comforts of a big company and a steady um, paycheck. And I uh, jumped over to Moose, which was a small company. We opened our doors and we didn't necessarily have revenue. I signed on for this six month contract. Um, if we didn't get enough business to stay afloat, people would have to be let go. And that's the industry we're in. And that does happen. There are risks. And something about knowing that this is the industry we're in and that there are risks makes me less fearful of risks. It's like, okay, it's just part of it. So I signed on. And the lesson here is embrace challenges and change. Nothing makes you ready to embrace challenges and change than this kind of sink or swim situation that we were in as a startup. And um, here's a small story that illustrates what I mean. So um, throughout your career, you're gonna be faced with all sorts of decisions and all sorts of um, times where you may doubt yourself. And you may say like, am I ready? Can I do this? And it involves a pretty big leap. So I was faced with my first big challenge pretty soon after we opened and our client had a big need and we were the ones that had to pull it off for them. They wanted to enlist bartenders from across the country to be part of an ambassadors program. And it was like building our own influencer army, but before any real influencer tools like Instagram or anything like that. So Musylvania somehow overnight had to figure out how to be, um, have to come up with an idea that would get people excited and wanna get involved. We had to become experts in bartender training, um, event execution, mixology culture, event promotion. And um, it, was, it was a lot and we really had to just jump in and figure it out as we went. And I'll never forget a conversation I had with my dad as this was happening. Um, and, you know, I'm telling a little bit about work and the new job. And he, this is what he asked me. He said, wait, don't they have people to do that? And I looked at him and I said, um, dad, I'm the people. I, it's on me. I'm figuring it out. And there was something really that just crystallized the um, experience for me. Like, yes, I'm the people. I can do this. I just need to figure it out. And that it was that kind of um, mindset that really helped us continue to grow and to push and to try new things and not be afraid if it was going to be a little different tomorrow than it was today, because that's what that's what you had to do to get to the next level. And now to our fourth step, check mark. Um, 
so that's where I am now. And um, the lesson here is never stop learning. Um, this one is really simple and something that um, I'm doing all the time. And how does that look? That doesn't always look like reading books or reading articles. Or, or that is all part of it. Um, it's not all going to speakers or sessions, even though that's part of it. It's also really important for a creative person to continue to feed their creative self. Because I know if your creative tank isn't full, you're not going to come up with those ideas, those new approaches, the new way to look at things. So, you know, never stop learning takes a lot of different forms for creative people. Um, even just going to an art museum, going to a new city, like when we can travel again, just soaking up different experiences is all part of that human journey of learning. So we are going to talk about a word that's associated with learning, that's associated with challenges, that's associated with um, some of the other lessons that I talked about, and that's the word mistake. So when you think of the idea of a mistake, what do you think of or how does it make you feel? So go ahead to the chat and um, share with me what you think of, just one word. How does it make you feel or what do you think of? And you think of the idea of a mistake. Nice, Gregory. <laughs> I love it. So really, we'll just let Gregory's answer stand. Gregory's got a great one where he says the mistakes are an opportunity. And there is a mindset shift around that fourth lesson where we say never stop learning. Part of learning is making mistakes. And a lot of times mistakes come across as regrets or make us feel like, dang it, I shouldn't have done that. But really mistakes are our biggest indication of where we can learn more, where we can strengthen ourselves and where we can get better. And I love that word opportunity. I should probably change this slide even. Mistakes are opportunities. So now um, I'd like to take a moment. This is a pretty quick quiz. I'd like to take a moment for you all to do just along with me. We won't share it. You don't need to use the chat. And you don't even need a piece of paper if you don't want. But um, we're going to go through five questions on a quiz to just do an assessment of a mindset. So there's, like I said, there's going to be five questions. And give it a ranking. As I go through it, give it a ranking. One, if you give it a one, you say, not true at all. If you're giving it a five, you're saying it's the most true. And you can give any number in between, one, two, three, four, five. And so um, well, let's show the first statement. You can learn things, but you cannot change how smart you are. So in your mind or on a piece of paper, give that a one, two, three, four, or five. One least true to five most true. For this next one, one to five, I like work when I can do well without effort. Where are you at in how you look at things now? And how do you think of it? Three, I like doing work that I can do perfectly almost all the time. From one to five, where do you think you stand? Four, when I'm receiving feedback, I'd wish the person kept it to themselves. And it's okay if you'd say, well, most of the time I, I think this, some of the times I think this, that's okay when you're ranking it. Just give yourself kind of the a medium assessment then. And here's the last one. Change is inevitable, but I avoid it if I can. So those are the five. So, you know, add it up in your head or on a piece of paper or wherever, and you can look. And um, this whole quiz is really about growth mindset. So if you have lots of low numbers, the more growth mindset behaviors you already have. If you have lots of high numbers, you have an opportunity to put more growth mindset behaviors to work. And I realize I just 
shouted out a new phrase here, growth mindset. And maybe you've been talking about this in different contexts. Maybe you're a fan of Brene Brown. Maybe you've heard of this type of thing. Um, so in the idea of growth mindset, um, why what made it part of my talk today was just that at Purina and at Checkmark, we believe very much in a growth mindset. Um, and I took that quiz from materials they have us go through and they have available for us. And it's a very simple idea that's actually pretty profound. When you have a growth mindset, you believe you can grow and improve your skills and intelligence. That's not fixed. Skills and intelligence are not set traits. You love challenges. You think the best way to learn is by working hard. You don't mind making mistakes or looking bad in order to get better. And um, those are the types of things that um, can help you, the growth mindset can get you unstuck. So when I went through those four different lessons, I did frame them up in terms of probably most of, in what's probably the most leading principles of growth mindset, of seek feedback, embracing effort, embracing challenges and change, and never stop learning. So. Like I said, I told my story about mistakes and misdirections and challenges, and those core principles ended up saving me each time. Now, at the time I didn't know, and I wasn't consciously thinking like, I need to turn on my growth mindset, but um, life hit me hard enough to where uh, it actually forced me into many of these lessons. Now, I think that they can help anyone, but I especially feel that um, creatives are well suited and they can really help us in a special way. Because really the truth is having a growth mindset is hard. Um, it's not always, come; it doesn't always come naturally. But the good news is you can do hard things. And like I started to say, um, in the creative universe, I think we are specially equipped. Um, I'd like to pause and just celebrate all of us creative brains who are here in the room and who are out in the world because we are perfectly suited to be in this world that requires adaptability, flexibility, growth. As we're out there looking for jobs and join, looking to join companies, these are the skills they want. They want adaptability, flexibility, growth. And as creatives through our craft, we already have a lot of those kind of muscles that we were working. So if we lean into it even a little bit more with this growth mindset, we're gonna be that much further ahead. You know, through our craft, we try a design and it fails. Okay, fine, another idea will come along. We might get stuck. We push until we get to something that works. Um, we love to learn something new. We collaborate with each other. We're intrigued by other work. We naturally have these behaviors in order to be good artists and good creatives. So um, really, when I think about creativity and growth mindset, it goes hand in hand. And it absolutely is something that takes courage. These icons are icons I use in our creative group. Um, we talk about having our creative brain. We talk about having our superpower of courage. And it's something that um, I really believe differ is differentiating for you as an individual as you're looking for a job. And then also differentiating for you as um, an employee when you are performing on the job to get that next promotion and to go to that next level. So, um, man, I, I just am so glad that I started on this creative journey and stayed on it. Um, I'm glad I get to do what I do. I'm glad to do it with the people that I do it with. Um, and I love to talk about it. I love to talk about um, this journey and how to keep growing and how to keep getting better. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk with all of you, like the next generation coming up. I think that's really exciting. Um, this is me on LinkedIn, if you wanna find me. My picture has kind of like a blue background um, and you'll know that's me. And that's where I'll stop it. I'm here to uh, say thank you so much for um, having me. And then I left this extra time for questions or any other uh, things that you might want me to go back to or talk about that I haven't talked about yet. Thank you so much, Teresa. Awesome. So we got uh, 
We got a lot of thank yous in the chat. Does anybody have any questions for Teresa while we have her? Um, they can be, uh, you know, questions specifically about uh, the all of the different breakdowns of jobs within the field. Um, they can be, uh, you know, journey specific to sort of how you moved from from company to company. Uh, perhaps more about some of those downward and or upward squiggle lines of that journey. Um, yeah, we have Teresa here. We've got an extra almost 20 minutes for questions. So you guys feel free to, you know, turn your mics on, uh, ask those, or you can put them in a chat and I will read them out loud. I'll start out with a question if that's okay. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Teresa, you had talked about your experience at Moose and embracing challenges and change. How would you say that relates to Checkmark, especially over the past year? Oh, a different kind of challenge and change, absolutely, yes. with COVID. Yes. Um, so I, I would say that challenges in all forms um, feel pretty dang scary, don't they? Like, and you kind of get into this self-doubt mode. So though I'd say that's in, those are definitely in common where you're like, well, shoot, how am I going to do that? And um, I love the analogy of like looking at a rock wall, like of climbing and you're, and you're like, how in the world am I going to get there? And it's one little hold at a time. And you look for those little cracks and you look for those little things to kind of claw your way through. Um, with COVID, one thing that was a different kind of pressure, I think was being able to clue into other people's emotions. So that's another topic for another day. But um, in order to be an effective team member, you really have to develop that kind of empathy and emotional intelligence to understand where they're coming from. So I think that was really helpful um, to lean on that skill. I don't know if I had that kind of developed skill or even leaned on it as much with a startup like Moose, but um, here at Purina, I felt like we really had to dial up that listening and that empathy and that emotional intelligence to get through that challenge. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I have a semi-tangential related question. Um, uh, so you're talking about growth mindset, which could be a new term for some people um, who don't vigilantly follow Bren Brene Brown. Um, so my main question is how, what are some good ways that you can actually foster a growth mindset if, if maybe during that quiz, you put a lot of high numbers. Um, so how, how can you kind of retrain your brain um, to sort of be more accepting of the unknown, uh, willing to take on those challenges? Oh, great question. Um, I think the first one is the one about mistakes or, or even maybe it's not even so much a mistake, just like a, a cringe or an uh. So at, at that moment, you have a conscious decision how you tell your brain how you're going to take that. It's like, are you going to beat yourself up? Are you going to start a critical loop in your head? Or um, are you going to say, that happened? What's next? That happened? Where am I going to climb onto next? Um, that single decision, I think, is one of the first best practices of a growth mindset is how do you frame mistakes or setbacks or um, just things that are seemingly impossible? <laughs> the other thing, just in general, um, growth mindset's a term that's out there for sure. So um, if you Google growth mindset, um, you'll find everything from inspirational quotes to practical tips and steps. Um, or go back and watch this for those four pieces of growth mindset that I really like. But those are kind of some next steps too that might help. Um, I, I know I've got my uh, class that's in, in the group right now and uh, our reading that we went over today is actually very uh, graphic design uh, job application specific. Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, since we have you, um, are there any specific do's and don'ts that you would uh, give advice to uh, some of the students that maybe are going to be stepping out of academia for the first time and applying for those initial uh, positions? 
um, any oh. parent uh, pitfalls that maybe we can sidestep for them? Um, a, I can think of a couple. One is understand what job you're applying for. So I know I spent only you know five or so minutes on that chart. If you have specific questions about the roles, we can talk about that. But really understand what you're trying to apply for. One mistake I see a lot, um, this was back when I was advising at SLU, was that I'd have somebody come in and they'd say, um, I want to be a copywriter strategist designer. And that's fine. And in some small companies, you'll be able to do that because you'll be able to wear a lot of hats. But if you're going into an organization that has some roles that are more well-defined, understand what the role is and understand how you can fit in and what value you can bring. Um, another mistake that I see happen is that people don't bring enough thought or um, almost justification for the decisions that they're making with their book and their design and um, I think that most companies really want to understand your thought process as well as your design. So spend some time um, articulating why you did the things that you did in a non-design way. Understand the design stuff, but also the business stuff. So make sure you understand um, what you were trying to do. Like this was important. This is who I'm trying to talk to. Here's how I can measure the success. Those types of terms. People. Um, in the real world um, want to hear not about, not only about the design, they wanna hear about the impact as well. Does that make sense? Those are the two big things I would say. Thank you for that. All right, guys, we still got room for some more questions. Ashley, you look like you, you got something to chime in there. Yeah, I was gonna piggyback on your question, um, just at least for the sake of students, like as they are, job hunting. I think there's a lot of talk around events are going to be picking back up in the fall possibly. And of course, agencies are going to have this huge surge of work coming in and they don't have enough people at the moment to take that on. And they're going to have to probably hire on a lot of contract or freelance workers. Is there anything, Teresa, that given that you oversee all of us who are hired on as contract, is there anything in particular that you're looking for or any advice that you have for students who would likely be filling those roles versus oh, like a full-time? Sure. sure. And um, Eva, I saw your question. And then also in the chat, um, I put a book that I wanted to recommend and I didn't want to forget. So I just threw that in there. You're probably like, what is that? So I'll come back to this in a second. But as far as contractors, um, there are going to probably be some types of positions that are going to open up because things are going to be unpredictable, like you said. Um, and really, I think that um, when you get the position, were you asking more once you're in the position or how to get it? Uh, you could do both. If you have so to start. I'll start with once you got it. <laughs> once you got it, do anything just be helpful that's the number one thing and i'm not saying make yourself a slave and work all weekend or anything like that but just do anything and that's good whether you're full-time or contractor but but just having that positive attitude and ready to take things on and try things and be there for the team that goes a very long way and if you mess up which you inevitably will like i did with my first big assignment they saw you gave your effort, so they'll keep you on. Um, and then regarding how to get that job, it kind of goes along with any other um, trying to get that job. Understand what they need, what role they are, and ha have a good book and be able to talk through your work. Um, that helps a lot. You might, in contractor positions, have to sell yourself to a recruiter. And um, in that case, there's this book that I put in called 60 Seconds in Your Hired. You don't need to read the whole book, but I, I um, recommend this book highly because it gets you in a practice of being able to sell yourself and your skills in a short way. And it doesn't have to be 60, maybe it's 50, whatever, but there's a lot of valuable tips. It's a self-evaluation and it gets your, your story down. Um, so I recommend that as you're going into the interview world. 
Um, and as far as how do you get yourself back up again when you have self doubt, I think um, you have to celebrate every little success on that wall, man, <laughs> you know, like, um, and even now um, we were doing a rollout of a new technology here. Like this is true happening today. Um, and I had a moment where I'm like, well, that didn't go so well. And so I just thought about, all right, what can I do to turn it around? I'm not gonna get off the wall. I'm just gonna find a new, new thing to hold on to. And my mode in this particular one was write down a plan and just keep going. Um, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. <laughs> um, do you um, know, okay, oh, sorry. I saw a question. Uh, oh, I was just gonna read the question out loud. From, oh, yeah. uh, do you know of any positions for graphic designers who may be more centric in illustrative work, specifically oh. in a professional environment like Purina? Um, so I would say that um, a lot of that is dictated by the type of client and the type of work. Um, so I think that like we've hired several people that are more, um, they have more of a tilt toward animation or a tilt toward illustration or a tilt toward kind of like this three-dimensional thinking. And a lot of them end up in the packaging department, but not all of them. Um, and so, um, there are sometimes opportunities where that extra skill gives you a bit of a boost for something that might be more of a traditional all encompassing type role. But if you're over here and you're saying, no, I pretty much want to illustrate all the time, you could explore an idea of becoming an independent and then getting hired by different departments and different agencies. And you're that specialty now as a vendor, as an illustrated vendor. Um, and then what you would need in that case is um, get hooked up with a rep, get hooked up with um, those types of resource um, pools. So then that way, when someone's looking for that style, they can find you. Great question, Monica. Appreciate that one. Um, all right. Any other questions? get some more in the chat or if anybody wants to turn their microphone on. Okay, we've got from Sophia, are there any internship opportunities available for creatives? I don't know if she's talking specifically about at Purina or at I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, see, look at that. Uh, good comment, Gregory. Um, so uh, for Sophia, um, I would say at checkmark at Purina, we don't have a lot of opportunities for um, internships right now. Um, we haven't for the past several years. And the reason why I don't wanna give a hard no to that is because it's something that I've always wanted to keep pushing and to do. I already said how much I love um, college students and the energy of you guys. Um, uh, so it's not a hard no, but it's something right now for this summer we, we don't have. Uh, Ad Club does that internship go round thing. They did that a couple years ago. I see some heads nodding. So um, that's one. And then um, I feel like there are definitely like internships when you kind of network they, that I've seen people get, especially in St. Louis. So how do you even, where do you even start? Um, a lot of times what I've seen people do is like, they'll see a piece of work or they'll see something done on social media and they'll be like, where is, who does that? Where's that from? And they'll try and hook themselves up, talk to these different professionals. Do you have internships? And I would love for there to be like one bank of all possible internships, but I have seen people find opportunities just through networking. All right, any other questions? Any specific questions about the breakdown of different types of jobs? I know we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of people engaging with that prompt that you gave everyone sort of talking about uh, the different types of creative. Absolutely. Anyone want any more information on that while we have Teresa with us? Yeah, there's a small group that shadowed this morning. So if anybody from that group has questions, feel free to shout.
did you guys go into all the new stuff on friskies all the crazy new flavors and everything if you have cats shameless plug um there's <laughs> a lot of fun new kind of flavors on friskies and fancy feast yeah we talked um about low gravies and like the april fools that oh, happened yeah. on that one and then we walked through um just like the process of a project so account and then creative and then we went to um, production and then had our um, digital side along with project manager speak. So nice. it was really helpful for them to see that whole process. But yeah, April Fools was something where given that brand of Friskies, it lends itself really well to it, but also speaking about the trust that you have with the team and developing that relationship with the client it really allows you to do these one-off kind of fun projects that might not be in, um, you know, the whole scope of things or something that's usually done, but it's fun to be able to do things like that. Oh yeah. Turned out great. Thanks. All right. I guess if we don't have any more questions, we can go ahead and close it out for the afternoon. I don't want to take up too much of y'all's time. It sounds like you guys already did uh, a, a walkthrough earlier today. Um, okay, I want to thank you both for joining us today. And Ashley, thank you again for nominating Teresa. It's been so nice to get to know her over the past day and a half. Um, and uh, as always, uh, thank you all for giving us uh, time uh, on your busy Fridays. And uh, yeah, uh, Teresa, Ashley, everyone, I'll let you go. And then uh, anyone who is in my lecture class, we will be logging back on to our separate group in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks so Thank much. you again. Bye. Bye.